Good morning, church. We're glad that you're tuning in with us this morning. Let's worship the Lord. He has done some great things. He gives us life. He gives us grace. He gives us freedom. Come on. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what He's done. Oh, see what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero. Oh, hero of it. And you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great. been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Yes, you will. Because God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake in the light. Oh, Jesus, I say your, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, I say. Your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, you have done great things, oh God, you do great things. Yeah. You do great things, God. You are a great God for mercy and grace. You give us life, God. You're the breath in our lungs, God. Let's sing that out. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Oh. 
I love that idea that he fills us up with life. So we give it back. We pour it out on him with gratitude and thanksgiving. Let's sing this. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. I'll sing that again. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise to you only. Yes. Great are you, Lord. the earth and shout your name. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Oh, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. sing this. Great Give it back, Lord. Serve only you. You gave us life, God. You give it back, Lord. Serve only you. We live for you. You gave us life, God. You give it back, Lord. We live for you. Great are you, Lord. And God, we're amazed at the, the messages in that song held together. Your greatness. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of all praise. 
And so we humbly submit to you as the great God. But then we're also amazed that not only are you worthy of our praise, but you um, empower us to even worship. Because the breath in our lungs comes from you every single moment. And I can't help but think not too far removed from our recent celebration of Easter Sunday of that very first breath of Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And we're thankful that not only uh, does your Holy Spirit um, bring life in all places, at all times, but that you breathe your life into us today. And as Andy mentioned, we breathe in that life through the spirit that you have given to us, and then we breathe that life back out as a, a, an offering of worship to you today. We're just thankful for, the, thankful for the privilege to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, some of you are standing in your kitchens, <laughs> standing in the middle of your living room. Um, no, we're just going to take a few moments and uh, do a few announcements, and then we'll worship a little more uh, together. But our, our first announcement is just uh, to let you know about the e-connections, if you don't already. And we have a nice, beautiful graphic for you to take a look at our schedule throughout the week. We've been doing this, uh, obviously, for four or five weeks now. And we really appreciate all of you guys engaging with us online throughout the week. It's been really cool, a cool way to connect with one another. So we'll keep that up throughout this week, and you can take a look at the schedule and join us. Yeah, and I love, I love it that not only are there people joining us live in real time, but according to some of the statistics that I've seen, there are a lot of people who can't be there in the moment but are catching up afterwards on Facebook and YouTube. So continue to do it. We love to see it, and we hope that you love engaging in that way. I want to also just, again, say thank you for your continued giving and your generosity. It's incredible. Uh, we continue to be able to do the ministry and mission that we are called to uh, during this challenging, difficult time. Uh, we're thankful for those who have given online. Some of you starting that very uh, fresh and new. Some of you setting up that recurring giving. So we're thankful for all of that that's happening in the electronic realm. And we're also thankful for those who are sending it in the old-fashioned way through the USPS and, and sending it in through the mail. So just thank you again for allowing us, empowering us to do the things that God continues to call us to do. Absolutely. Um, and we want to put this in front of you also. Um, if you are not already on our email lists, we have two of them. We have one for prayer requests, and we have one for just general news um, uh, events that are upcoming. Well, not right now, but uh, we'll use that in the future for that. Uh, right now, it's been helpful for giving you guys information about what the church is doing in response to the COVID-19 stuff. So if you want to be on either one of those email lists, uh, there you can go to this website uh, that is on the graphic right now in front of you, um, or there is a link on YouTube and Facebook in the description. You can click that link and go directly there, and you will find, um, right there, you will find a place to subscribe, uh, a link there, and it'll be pretty straightforward when you get to the website. So if you want to be on either of those lists, we want to certainly have you connected in that way. And finally today, um, Mother's Day is not too far away, and um, we were wondering about our kids and, and being able to have or get uh, presents for moms, and share a woman um, just has this burden on her heart to enable our kids to do that, even in the midst of our pandemic and, and the public health crisis and the limitations. And so here's what she's doing. She is offering um, a, a jar of love. It's like a, a craft project gift. So um, kids, if you want to make something for mom, all you need to do is uh, email Cheryl Woolman, um, and you can just reserve that by uh, May 4th. And as long as you get that to her, all she needs is like a name and how many kids in the household will be making that. Um, and if there's multiple kids in the household, obviously those multiple projects and gifts can be for mom, for grandma, for aunts, for people like that. Um, and then May 7th, you'll just drive through under the carport here at the church and, and sure we'll have them all packed up and ready to go in individual containers for you to take home and create something beautiful for Mother's Day because we know many of you just, you can't get out of the house in order to order something or buy something and so it's an opportunity to continue to offer mom a gift because kids, she needs it. Now more than ever, your mom needs to know that she is loved Preach. and appreciated. Yeah, no kidding. So, all right, I think that finishes up our announcement time for now. So let's do a couple more songs. Yeah, and uh, I don't know about you, but I've found myself counting my blessings these days in a different sort of way. 
you know, it's easy for us to get frustrated with some of the limitations that we're uh, faced with, not being able to see our loved ones and get out and go to a restaurant or, or whatever the case may be, send our kids off to school, all, all those sorts of things. It's easy to kind of um, to get frustrated about. But uh, on the other hand, I've found myself also just being grateful uh, for the health that, that I do have, the health uh, in our family, the, the shelter that we do have, um, that we have a place to call our own and to just... Uh, hang out, and, uh, you know, the technology that we have today that allows us to connect with one another in, in a way that wasn't possible uh, a decade or two ago. So um, if you are like me and you find yourself counting uh, your blessings in a different way, then let's just uh, raise our voices and thank God for all that we do have, because all that we have comes from Him. And um, so let's praise our God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exalt on and Praise God the Praise to the King, His throne transcends, His crown and kingdom never end. Now and throughout eternity, I'll praise the One who died for me. Praise. So, uh, in the Christian calendar, we are now in what is called Eastertide. So, yes, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that is one Sunday. But the season of Easter, Eastertide is seven Sundays long and up until Pentecost. So, you know what that means, Pete? It means 
we get to keep singing Easter songs, I think. That's what that means. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're going to break out some new Easter songs. Uh, this, this is an awesome song I want to teach you this morning. It's actually been around for uh, several years, um, but we haven't done it here, so it may still be new to some of you. It's called Forever. And uh, I wanted to look to Scripture before we sing this together. This is 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm actually going to ask if Amy would mind reading this. She has no idea that I'm asking her to do this. But she's got a better radio voice than I do. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says, When the perishable has clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Thanks be to God. So let's sing this new song. I'm going to ask Amy to do this as well. I'm uh, really making her work this morning. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your state? How resurrected King has rendered you Oh, what a day. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? How resurrected King has rendered you.
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing this again now forever now forever he is glorified forever he is lifted high forever he is risen he is alive he is alive Lord, thank you for overcoming sin and death. But just like 1 Corinthians, we can celebrate that we have life in you, that death no longer has sting because you have overcome it and you have brought the victory. Thank you that we can celebrate that not just on one Sunday, but every Sunday that we are free from sin and the chains and, uh, and the bondage uh, of shame and guilt, but have freedom in you. And now help us to use that freedom for your glory and for your kingdom as we go into the world and, and share the grace that you've given us with the world as we um, take your love uh, to the dark places. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to continue to talk about the theme of uh, uh, the authority of Christ, and really no greater authority than overcoming the grave. And today we're going to be talking about the amazing authority that we see that Jesus has in Luke chapter 4. So if you want to follow along with me, if you have a Bible with you, wherever you are, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 37. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching, because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. And all the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are! With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So in this passage, we see Jesus having authority uh, in two different ways, right? Authority as a teacher 
and authority as a healer and a deliverer. So that's what we're going to unpack today. But I want to start off by comparing this to something that we covered recently, because um, this is really just a replay of what happened in Nazareth, right? In Nazareth, he was in a synagogue on a Sabbath. So many details are the same, right? It almost looks like a carbon copy up front of what Nazareth was. But the conclusion, as you and I saw, is very, very different. In Nazareth, Jesus was forced out of the synagogue and nearly thrown off a cliff. Here, in this uh, synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus is celebrated as a person of power and a person of authority. He amazes those and captivates those who are around him in this particular synagogue. In Nazareth, Jesus was cast out by the people, and yet in Capernaum, it is Jesus who casts out the evil that is present there. In Nazareth, the people try and make Jesus go away, and in this synagogue in Capernaum, the demon tells Jesus to go away. But Jesus continues to stay right where he is, to bring the hope and the healing that only he can. During the temptation episode earlier in Luke chapter 4, just a few verses above this in Scripture, Satan, who is the ringleader of those forces of evil represented by the unclean spirit in this passage, Satan offers, if you remember, to give Jesus what? To give him authority, right? He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. It'll be yours. I'll give you all of this authority. And we see now, not too far on the heels of that, very early in Jesus' public ministry, he indeed does have authority. He uh, escaped that temptation and trap of the devil, and he extends his authority to the reaches of the spiritual realm. That authority Jesus has comes from his faithful identification as God's Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So think for just a moment about some of the most authoritative people you've dealt with in your life. People who exercised authority or influence over you. Think about the people who did it really, really well. Think about the people who maybe did it kind of poorly. How should authority be handled from a Christ-like perspective? Because that's another thing we're going to talk about a little bit today as well. This authority that Jesus has and then how we exercise authority as Christians. So let's dig into the two ways that Jesus was seen as authoritative in that passage. Um, He he is called uh, someone of authority two different times. The first time is when he is a teacher. So let's talk about how Jesus is a teacher. In Exodus 33, verse 13, we get this theme uh, of how God is teacher. Moses speaking with God as he attempts to lead the Israelites, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And then later in in Psalm, in the wisdom literature, Psalm 25, show me your ways, Lord, says the psalmist. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you. Jesus is many, many things. Savior, Lord, Messiah, King, suffering servant, prophet, Bread of life, water of life, the living water. But Jesus is also teacher. And at the beginning of his public ministry, that's what we see him doing in this synagogue on the Sabbath, acting as a teacher to the people. And we are his disciples. If you call yourself a disciple of Jesus today, you are a student or a learner. That's what it meant to be a disciple. Not merely just a believer in Jesus, although that is certainly a part of it, but a student, a learner from Jesus. Now, learning is not the only thing we need to do. Obviously, there's more to it than that for being a disciple, but to be a disciple assumes that we continue to learn from Christ our teacher. Now, we do not know the content of the message that Jesus gave to them in that synagogue on that Sabbath morning, but we are told that the people there were impressed because Jesus taught with authority. He taught with authority, which sort of makes me ask this question. What does it mean when you speak with authority, especially as like a a, a religious speaker? How, How do you show that you have authority? How do people sense that you are someone who is speaking with authority? Is it about certainty? 
When you speak and you communicate a very high degree of certainty, does that make you authoritative? Is it about credentials? Are you able to list a whole bunch of initials after your name? Do you have a really great resume and that makes you an authoritative speaker? Sometimes I think that we believe that it's about the volume of your voice that can make you authoritative, that the louder you speak or yell, or scream, or whatever it might be, that that is what makes you authoritative and gives you authority. I actually was thinking about that as I was preparing the message, thinking about um, uh, leaders, uh, speakers who tend to raise their voice in order to uh, bring about um, uh, a response of submission to their authority from their people. And it actually took me back to a video clip, and I'm going to want to show it to you today. It's like 90 seconds long. It's from a a, a movie, The Cat in the Hat. There was a modernized version of it that came out, man, probably 10 years ago. I don't know. It was one of my son's favorite movies um, when he was young. He would ask for this all the time. And near the beginning, you'll see in this clip, the credits are still coming up because it's very early in the, in the movie, in The Cat in the Hat. And um, uh, the, the main character, Joan, uh, it, she works in this office. Her boss is Mr. Humberflube, of course, because it's a Dr. Seuss book. And check out, not only does this tie into authority, but some of the uh, extra things that I saw, I was just like, oh, this is too good not to share. So think about um, authority and, and volume of voice in order to command authority when you check out this clip. Attention, everyone. It's 9.02. Staff meeting. Staff meeting. <laughs> First, I'd like to welcome aboard our newest member of the Humberflube family, Jim McFlinnigan. Mr. Humberflube. I wanted to thank you. Fired. I beg your pardon? Fired. Could I? Fired! <laughs> As you know, tonight is our bi-monthly meet and greet party. Tonight's host is Joan Walden. This is where people can meet our real estate agents in an informal yet hygienic setting. Mr. Humberflube, I have to get home to my kids. Ah, yes. Your children. Joan, let me make this perfectly clear. If your house is as messy as last time, That's pretty clear, Mr. Humberflute. Don't worry, I promise. My kids will be on their best behavior. Great. So there you have it. Is it the volume of your voice that makes you have the air of authority for people? We don't know the content of Jesus' message. We don't know uh, how he was sensed as authoritative. We do know from Scripture, however, that we can assume that that authority came from his return from the wilderness. In in chapter 4, verse 14 of Luke, he returned from the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what made him authoritative. So listen, you can speak loudly for God if you want to. You can claim a high degree of certainty if you would like to. You can uh, claim a bunch of different credentials if you think that's helpful. But to be honest, if the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, does not empower your words, they will fall flat. And I actually rejoice in that as a good thing. Because I don't really think it necessarily is good for the loudest people or the best credentialed people or, or, or people um, who are commanding that authority to receive it. I, I think it's the people who are clearly led and empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit of God. So today, are we amazed and astonished at the authority that Jesus has to teach us still? Do the words that Jesus records in there in scripture that we can read there do they have authority over us do we submit to the authoritative teaching of jesus or do we read it and kind of go well that's good advice he seems like a really wise man or is it actually authoritative because john 14 jesus speaking says the advocate the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things god still wants to teach us do the words of jesus still have authority in our lives But Jesus is not only given authority um, by uh, that crowd as they sense his authority through his teaching, but also through his his deliverance of this man who is is, uh, 
influenced by this unclean spirit. And one of the things I want to look at is how Jesus speaks to silence the resistance that is present because of the demon. After speaking authoritatively uh, uh, through teaching, Jesus focuses on this man who is present in the synagogue and we read is under the influence of an unclean spirit or a demon. And I want to pause for just one second and, and say, can we appreciate the fact that this man is in the synagogue at all? This man who is fighting his demons is in the synagogue. Now, I don't know where he was standing. I kind of picture him in like the back, back row um, or like leaning up against the doorway somewhere uh, on the fringe. But I just want to say, how amazing is it? Can we appreciate the idea that the local gathering of God's people is the best place to be if you are fighting some demons? I mean, that's what this is, the synagogue at the time. This is the local gathering of God's people. Our churches should be places that make space for people who are fighting their demons. And I know from talking to some people, when they're in the midst of fighting their demons, the last place they think they are welcome is amongst a gathering of God's people for worship. There is this understanding that you need to get yourself cleaned up, that you need to finalize and finish all those battles before you come. No, 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 no. Amongst God's people, bring those battles with whatever demons you're fighting. It's the place where you belong. Now, this evil spirit recognizes Jesus and knows that there is nothing between them but opposition. Nothing between Jesus and this spirit but a sense of opposition, and so responds with resistance. It's as if there are two fighters, two boxers in the ring between this unclean spirit and Jesus, and the spirit knows there is nothing but opposition. And so resistance is the only thing left. The man says, go away. What do you want with us? That us is interesting, isn't it? Some scholars say that he's referring uh, to the demon and the man. Uh, Other scholars, and I would lean this way, way, say that uh, that that unclean spirit, the us, is is all of those uh, spiritual forces of darkness and evil. No matter the kind or type or brand or flavor of evil and unclean spirit. Jesus is setting himself against all of them. And that demon successfully and correctly identifies who Jesus is, you know, son of God. He knows who he is, and he correctly identifies what Jesus has come to do. He asks that question, have you come to destroy us? And the answer is yes. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, to silence the resistance that is present to the will of God. And it's really, really easy to want Jesus to silence resistance, resistance when it is outside of us and on a broad scale. I mean, I'm sure all of us are praying against this pandemic right now. It's easy to pray against big stuff like genocides, right? When we say those things are resistant to God's will and we pray against them, we ask God to silence them. That's relatively easy, but my friends, what happens when that resistance is inside of us? Is it as easy to say, God, silence my resistance on the internal part of who I am? In some ways, do we instead echo that unclean spirit, just leave me alone? Maybe not entirely, leave me alone, but I think there are corners and bits and pieces of our hearts and our our minds where we say, just leave that part alone. Don't bother me with that particular thing, Jesus. Are we willing to allow him to speak to those areas of resistance today? That demon is silenced. And we're going to finish that story in just a moment. But before we go there, I am bringing another friend up to join me at the table. Um, And so, Dave, if you want to venture up here, Dave Brooks, the legendary Dave Brooks, not not infamous, I'm not going to say that, But the legendary Dave Brooks is here, and he agreed to uh, join me at the table here and to um, answer some questions, which I sent him ahead of time to prayerfully consider. So are you ready, Dave? This is for you. Yeah, that's all you, man. Thanks for coming. It is a high seat. (laughs) Make sure you hold that thing nice and close to your chin. We want want to get all this wisdom, (laughs) plenty of volume on it. (laughs) 
It is, these are high, aren't they? That's what yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like sitting at a high top table at a restaurant. Oh, restaurants. <laughs> I yearn for those days. <laughs> what are those? Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's talk a little bit about authority. Um, can you talk a little bit about the jobs or roles that you have had in your life <laughs> that came with them some sort of authority or influence on people? What was it like to step into roles and jobs like those? Well, I have spent my, uh, all of my adult working career in the field of education. And I started out, <clears throat> I taught fifth grade in Salem for 10 years. Then I went down to Southern Local for 22 years as an elementary principal. And uh, after 32 years, I retired. And uh, I stayed out a couple of years, and then I was approached by uh, the Lisbon School District to uh, take the uh, position of Director of Special Education. Okay. And uh, I am finishing up my 23rd year uh, at Lisbon <laughs> <laughs> right now. And uh, so, so you ask what I felt like when I stepped into those roles, yeah. and, and it was kind of strange because I felt the same way in all three of those venues. Huh. And the feeling that I had was, what do I do now? <laughs> Am I ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I remember my first uh, day of teaching when I was right out of college at the old McKinley building there in Salem. Um, bell rang, kids came into the room. They all sat down, had their hands folded on their desk. I looked out at them and I thought to myself, uh, what now? Uh, and so there was anxiety, and it was the same as when I became a principal. There was anxiety, there was even a little bit of intimidation. Yeah. And, and as you said, I felt like, am I ready to be what I need to be here? Yeah, yeah, and then you kind of grow into a role, I assume. <clears throat> yeah, I learned. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I'm also trying to imagine a room full of students with their hands folded on their desk. Like, I can't even imagine that in the world in which we live today. <laughs> first, first day. <laughs> okay, only the first day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> Oh, all right, let's move on. Um, having authority over people when done well requires a balance of a lot of things, in my opinion. And feel free to disagree with me at any point. But I think it's a balance of empowering them, correcting them, guiding them, challenging them, holding them accountable when necessary, but also encouraging them. So what kind of balance do you see as the most beneficial when you exercise influence and authority over people? Well, I always sort of equate... Uh, authority with leadership mm -hmm. and and what I want to talk about is basically is when I was a principal okay uh, and how I dealt with the staff more than the kids the mm -hmm. kids is a whole another mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. but uh, my style of leadership if you want to put it that way it was more or less it was a collaborative effort it wasn't a dictatorship mm -hmm. it wasn't a situation where I told them what they were going to do and you do it mm -hmm. but whenever I needed to make a decision or I wanted to uh, try something new or um, I wanted to make a change, I always discussed it with the staff. And my hope was that they would buy into it, that they would um, assume ownership of it, that they would feel like they had some played some role mm -hmm. in getting uh, to that process. Having said that, there were times when that didn't always happen. Oh and that's when I guess the role of leader or authority would come into play because I felt if I wanted to do something that I felt in my heart was beneficial to the kids mm -hmm. and to the school, even if the teachers didn't necessarily dis uh, agree with that, I would basically try to get them to, to, as I say, to buy into it. But a lot of times, there were times that they didn't. Mm -hmm. But I would say to them, look, I think this is something that's beneficial to the kids, beneficial to the school, and I want you to try it. I want mm -hmm. you to give it a shot. But having, while I was saying that, I was saying in the back of my mind, I know that if this isn't a bad idea, <laughs> if this doesn't work, uh, I need to be man enough to say, look, guys, uh, you know, my fault here. I, this didn't work out yeah, the way I thought. Yeah. You know? So let's uh, try something else. What was that idea you had? You know, so uh, so I, I, it wasn't my, my style of leadership wasn't the my way or the highway thing. Mm -hmm. It was a collaboration. I thought it was a, like a team effort and mm -hmm. because I think you would have a much better chance of success yeah. of trying to get done what you wanted to get done if you did it as a team. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the whole idea of presenting it, getting, getting the buy-in, but I like how you talked about sometimes you have to fight the resistance if you believe that the overall goal yeah. is, is, is worth it. So. People are uncomfortable with change. Yeah. They like the, they yeah. Like the familiar. Yeah, yeah. So. I, amen, brother. We didn't amen. do it that way before. Oh, you know, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. How many times you hear that? Yeah. 
Oh, all right, let's finish up with this last question. Um, for people who have some form of authority or influence over, over others and are Christians, um, there's obviously a desire to have Christ shine through in the ways that they lead. And you've already talked a little bit about how you chose to lead in those situations. So um, how did in the past or does your relationship today with Jesus affect the ways that you try and exercise authority over those who have entrusted that authority to you? Well, as I thought about this, um, uh, I believe that all Christians um, are called to try to emulate Christ in the way they live their lives, uh, the way they interact with other people, whether they're in a position of authority or not. But as a leader, um, and, and I don't want to just throw this out as a, you know, kind of a trite saying, but as a leader, as a Christian leader, I think you try to uh, be as Christ-like as you can in dealing with, with other people. And I think that involves listening to them, trying to be understanding of them, uh, trying to be compassionate. Um, when you're at a place, as I was for 22 years, with a, with a group of people, um, I, I would always try to remember these are people with their own lives, people that have families, have kids, have parents, have grandparents. And in 22 years, things occur. Mm -hmm that are going to affect them as a teacher. And so I know I was gonna get involved with, with those kinds of things. And I, just one example, I had a teacher who uh, experienced just a, an unimaginable tragedy in her life and in the life of her family. And it was so emotionally traumatic and debilitating that, and this happened in the fall of the year, this thing that happened. Uh, she could not return, and she did not come back for the rest of the year. And I remember going to her house and <clears throat> talking with her, and I prayed with her, and I wanted her to know that we cared about her. And uh, as the year progressed, uh, the rest of that year, I would call her periodically just to check on her and to see how she was doing. And, uh, and I never really thought about this, but when she came back the next year in the fall, uh, she apparently had related some of our conversation uh, to some of the other, her, her colleagues, her other teachers, and they came to me and told me what she had said and how much she appreciated the fact that we cared about her mm -hmm. and that we didn't forget about her mm -hmm. and uh, how much that meant to her. And so I think that there are things that you can, uh, that you run across, uh, you have conversations with individual people, you have conversations with groups of people, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a teacher's lounge at lunchtime, but there's a lot of conversation. I try, I try and block those memories <laughs> as best I can. But I, I remember being in conversations about social issues, mm -hmm. for, for abortion, for example. And uh, people, it was a diverse group of people, mm -hmm. and they had different viewpoints about that. But I remember looking at me, and I, and I would say to them, look, in, in my view as a Christian, this is what I believe about abortion, mm -hmm. or whatever the, whatever the topic was. Um, one of the things about being a principal that I really didn't like that much was I had to evaluate the teachers, mm -hmm. uh, teacher performance. And when I had those conferences, a lot of times, or, or sometimes I had to say things that weren't necessarily complimentary <laughs> or uh, positive, but I tried to be kind, tried to be compassionate, tried to let them know that I was on their side and that I wanted them to be a successful teacher. And so I think if um, you treat people um, in a kind, compassionate way, and I couldn't help but think about that verse in Matthew that we're all familiar with that says, do unto others the way that you would want other people to do mm -hmm. unto you, uh, that I, my hope and prayer was that, that people would see Christ shining through your life as you've indicated. Yeah, and that's, I mean, as, especially as a leader, a person of authority or influence is that when you do that, you sort of set the model or the standard for that group of people, and, you know, hopefully they aspire to it, so. Yeah. All right. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for joining me, Dave. I appreciate it. Give me one of those. Oh, yeah. Um, so, let's finish up the story about uh, Jesus in this synagogue, and um, he has been seen as an authoritative teacher. He has spoken uh, to the, the resistance in that uh, unclean spirit to silence. And now we get the moment of delivery where, de where, where Jesus delivers from the, the power 
and the grip of evil. And, and we tend to overly dramatize, in general, scenes of exorcism, right? We tend to, um, you know, movies and television shows, it, it gets pretty wild. But that's actually not what happens in this passage. If you remember what we read, um, the demon, the unclean spirit, throws down the man. But it says that he was not injured at all. Um, there's no violence here. This demon is no real match for Jesus, this is not a struggle between equal foes. It's not a fair fight. It's not a scene of violence and struggle, but it's a scene of what I would call submission and release. That's how I view that phrase, the man being thrown down in front of them all. It's not an act of violence. It's an act of submission. That unclean spirit knows that he is totally outmatched by the Son of God, the Messiah, the promised one. And so he releases that man as an act of submission to Jesus. I read a quote from uh, a commentary this week. The picture is of the complete acquiescence of the demon and his delivering the man over to Jesus. The demon's work is ended. The man is free from its influence and restored to his people. So it leaves us with questions like this today. Do we believe that Jesus has authority in the spiritual realm? Do we believe uh, in the words of the unclean spirit, of who Jesus is and uh, what that ident- identity carries with it in the form of power and authority. And then do we have the desire to be released from the spiritual forces of evil? Because sometimes we can recognize Jesus has the power, but we can sort of still resist and say, well, just stay away from this particular area and leave me alone. Which leads to the third question, are we willing to submit ourselves to the authority of of Christ. Because I believe that he is still the deliverer, the one who can deliver us from evil, the one who can break the chains, the one who can set us free. And I will say this, because in in this story, it's like an immediate boom. Jesus speaks, uh, the unclean spirit releases. I do believe that sometimes the release that we experience through the authority of Jesus is is a little bit slower. It, it, It takes some time um, I kind of view, you know, how sometimes in the movie there's somebody holding onto the edge of a cliff and the person at the top sort of peels back one finger at a time. I think sometimes we experience that release through the authoritative power of Jesus uh, slowly and progressively over time, and that's okay. If you don't feel like uh, things are changing in the blink of an eye at the drop of a hat, I believe that sometimes that release from evil, that deliverance happens progressively. Moments, days, weeks, even sometimes years, but yet it is still the authority of Jesus that is at the root of it. When we submit to the authoritative voice of Jesus, speaking to the evil in us and around us and in and around our world, I wanna, the last note I want to make is that a significant re- result is the restored relationships that can happen. Uh, the quote from the uh, commentary, that that man, free of that unclean spirit, would be restored to his people. And man, how true is it that when um, we are willing to fight our demons, first of all, just acknowledge the way that the spiritual forces of evil have creeped into our lives, acknowledge it, fight against it, invite the authority of Jesus to speak over it. We find that relationships that were um, sometimes completely severed, sometimes just bent, um, can be restored because of the redeeming and delivering power that Jesus has. So, a few things for us to think about as we close, some reflections to pray about, um, to consider here in this moment and in the day and the week to come as we let this uh, story of Jesus uh, having amazing authority sink further and deeper into us. Here's the first one. Do you consider the teaching of Jesus to be powerful and authoritative or merely helpful advice or sagely wisdom? Do we allow the teaching authority of Jesus to have its proper place in our lives? Second, ask God in this moment of silent reflection to silence any resistance to his will that exists in your heart and in your mind. Invite him to destroy the work of the spiritual forces of evil. That unclean spirit recognized what Jesus was there to do. We read in 1 John, right, that that is what Jesus came to do, to destroy the work of the spiritual forces of darkness within us and around us. Lastly, take this moment to pray for someone you know who today is struggling with his or her demons. Pray that evil may be exposed in those situations and that deliverance can be found 
and the authority of Jesus and that it will be embraced. So take just a moment or two of silence to pray and reflect, um, and I will close that time of reflection with a word of prayer in just one moment, and then we will sing one more song together. Father, let us never stop being amazed and astonished at the authority that you have, at at the power and the majesty and might that you have. Yes, Jesus, you are our compassionate. You are our gentle shepherd. You are caring. But at the same time, we read stories like this and are reminded that you are one with utmost authority in what you teach and utmost authority in, in the spiritual realm that is around us. We're thankful um, that you seek us out to continue to teach us that we might learn and grow and follow, and that you seek us out to bring healing and hope and help um, to many of us who are desperately and deeply in need of that uh, redeeming love, the freedom that you can offer. And we pray that you would continue this week to teach us, to remind us, to grow us in faith of who you are, what you've done and what you can continue to do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing one more song together. And I hear the Savior say, And I hear that Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Lord, now indeed. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. Change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. Cause Jesus paid it all. Yeah.
has faded on all to him I owe sin I left the crimson stain he washed in white as snow Amen May you be astonished and amazed at the greatness, the glory, the power, the authority, the majesty of Jesus and his goodness to us, giving himself so that we might have life. Amen. Wherever you are now, wherever you're going next, go in God's grace.